Coming up on Digital Music Trends 218 on the 4th of February 2015, Jay-Z buys Wimp and Tidal, Spotify's 500 million round and Russia exit, the Super Bowl halftime show, Show.co's new gating function, Guevara's expansion, SoundCloud's iPad app, the music industry and leaks, Music Tech Fest the news and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linali and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And if you're listening on a streaming service or watching the video on YouTube, you should also know that you can download the show, uh, uh, you know, the full show and have it on your phone if you use the podcast app on iOS 8 or if you download any podcast, uh, uh, you know, downloading app uh, for Android. And the first up this week, uh, we have Andrew Dubber, Professor of Music Industry Innovation at the Birmingham City University. Universities, and also author of the book uh, Radio in the Digital Age, as well as director of Music Tech Fest. So busy times. Andrew, how's it going? It's very busy, as you mentioned. Yeah, a uh, lot going on, but nice to be here. It's great to have you. And it's also a pleasure to welcome to the show Steve Knopper, contributing editor at Rolling Stone and author of Appetite for Self-Destruction, as well as a new upcoming book on uh, Michael Jackson that is uh, going to come up um, hopefully next year. October. October. Wow. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, how's things? All good? Things are good. Yes, thank you for having me. Excellent. It's great to have you. And so, uh, no, it's great to hear that it's moving along. It's it's kind of crazy to think that we were talking about this a couple of years ago, and now it's actually yeah. it's, it's actually happening. And and so, uh, you know, this week we have quite a few stories to talk about, but also I want to hear uh, uh, updates from you guys on what, what you're working on. But uh, uh, first of all, uh, I guess we we kind of have to start uh, uh, by talking about uh, Jay Z. We have a very clear headline this week, uh, as uh, Project Panther Bitco Ltd, which is controlled by Jay Z, has agreed to buy Aspire, the parent company of streaming service WIMP and uh, uh, a parent company also of the recently launched high quality service Tidal that launched in the U UK and the US. So WIMP was available in Germany, Denmark, Norway, Poland and Sweden with about half a million subscribers apparently. And uh, in September of last year, uh, and we discussed this on the show at length, the company announced the launch of Tidal, uh, which is a service uh, targeting users uh, that want to stream uh, music at CD quality. Uh, and uh, that's been launched in the UK, US, Canada, the Netherlands, Finland, Ireland, Belgium, and Luxembourg. And it costs around £20 or $20 uh, uh, to, per month uh, for access. So, you know, we've seen a fair few articles around this. I'm, so you, I'm sure you guys have as well. You know, was it a good move for Jay-Z? Was it a long-term play or just a, a good sh short-term investment? Uh, if, you know, if the company gains value over the next couple of years uh, to then resell uh, what the hell is it going to do with it and uh, you know from my perspective it, it looks like a pretty solid buy just because Tidal was one of the few you know Wimp was one of the few companies that was actually public uh, it's been public for, for quite a few years and so they had to focus on, on making it uh, uh, profitable from, from the beginning uh, I don't know what, what you guys think uh, uh, Steve uh, any thoughts on Tidal Jay-Z and what, what the hell is going on there yeah, a, a few things. I mean, I, I found this story to be very, very interesting. I mean, one thing I think it speaks to is the the current speculative nature of streaming music. I mean, you know, fifty six million dollars is. I mean, it's certainly not the three billion dollars that Apple paid for Beats, but it's it's something certainly. And Jay Z is a major player, and he must see money in the future of streaming. Yeah. So I, you know, I think that's one aspect of this, and another aspect is is sort of. You know, one interesting thing about streaming is that up until this point, for the most part, the the cost of streaming services has been anywhere from free to about ten U.S. dollars a month, um, and that's it, it hasn't gone much higher than that. Um, but the title service, if I'm not mistaken, um, the it, the high quality service is something like nineteen dollars a month, so yeah, almost right. double. So maybe that's what Jay-Z is up to. I mean, maybe people are saying, well, how can we get the cost of streaming to go higher? And if, we, if, that's, if that's something that can be established, that's something we could invest in. That's more revenue. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's, I don't know. I think the whole streaming thing seems a little bit bubbly right now. You know, it's, we all agree probably that it's the future of the music business, the record business, but it hasn't established itself yet as the future and it hasn't really gotten full traction yet so everything's really speculative it's a, it's a pretty interesting time right now yeah and, and uh, uh andrew you are in sweden so uh, you know <laughs> puts you in a very good place to, to tell us what your right. thoughts about that <laughs> well, well not really because it's not launched in sweden um all right it, it's, yes it's, if you look through the list it's it's the scandinavian countries except for sweden uh which is kind of interesting well, I, had, but, um, I had sweden far, down in the list but maybe i was mistaken in the list that i had that i had i don't i don't think sweden's on the list of uh currently launched in um, but uh, sorry, I, I, I meant for WIMP, not Tidal. Last I checked, 
I meant for Wimp, not Tidal. You're right. Absolutely. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Tidal, Tidal, we're still waiting. I think Tidal's the interesting story here, I have yeah. to say. Um, wimps, wimps around. But uh, uh, far be it from me to give investment advice to Jay-Z, but I, I kind of think that um, Tidal is a really, really interesting story. I kind of, the, the problem with the streaming services, uh, or one of the problems with the streaming services, let's leave aside the whole kind of um, uh, lack of transparency in, in how they, they make payments. But um, one of the problems is the price is wrong. Um, it's both too high and too low, um, because if it was higher, then the uh, the revenue per listener is is, is a better uh, prospect. And if it's lower, the number of listeners makes it a valuable proposition. And and uh, there have been numbers done on on this in terms of you know you you drop the price right down and you get a, a truckload more listeners, and that actually generates revenue that starts to be a, a lot more significant uh, on that on that basis. Yeah. So um, so things like Spotify. Um, uh, you know, you, you don't know which way to put them, but they're in exactly the wrong place. And I think the really interesting thing for someone like me, and I, and I hope Tidal comes to uh, to Sweden very soon because I'll be first in the queue. Um, because one of the great things about living here is we've got the fastest broadband in the Western world. I've got one gig both directions nice. uh, in my house in the middle of a forest in the middle of nowhere. So it's well, not in the middle of nowhere, but but out of town. Put it that way. So and yeah. um, and and that's having that kind of capacity where where bandwidth is not a problem. And I've got a nice stereo, and I'll I'll pay a little bit extra to listen to the things that sound nice. I won't buy a Pono, um, but if I'm listening at home on a stereo in a nice system and I want streaming music, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll go for something like that. And I think that you don't need millions and millions of customers and, and a company that's worth millions and millions or even billions of dollars to make it worthwhile. You've got something that is a sustainable business with a clear target audience and, and a bunch of people like me will go, you know what, I'll pay a bit extra. Yeah. And interesting so, thing is that you don't actually lose a lot of money, like you know, or any money from the first customer, because there's no free trial apart from I think a couple of weeks worth of free trial. So essentially, from the word go, you're making money of those of those listeners. You're not losing money on them. Yeah, Just and if they got the capacity, uh, they'll probably stick with it. I think. Yeah, exactly. And also, like from a branding perspective, I don't know whether that that's been discussed much, but uh, I guess you know, Jay Z's probably looked at Doctor Dre and thought, "Well, I can do that." Uh, as far as you know. Uh, well, possibly, but but the other thing that that uh, they've clearly looked at is uh, they've noticed that Andy Chen's really smart. Yeah. He's the CEO. Um, and he, he, I mean, I've, I've met him, and of all of the people in that kind of position that I've met before, he strikes me as somebody you want to pay attention to and, and see where he goes. And if I was if I was in a position to be spending $56 million on a on a streaming company, I'd want it to be something that Andy was in charge of. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Steve, was there, was there any, any service in the U.S. that um, uh, Jay-Z could have, could have looked at uh, in, in this vertical, or, or was this a pretty unique case? Just yeah, trying, I think it's a, un think. a unique case. I agree with Andrew. I think that Tidal and Wimp are, are a, it's a solid company. Um, I think Tidal is, is the first and perhaps the only. I mean, Deezer has its high-quality service, but it, you have to get a Sonos hookup. Um, so I think, I think Tidal has the, you know, the quote-unquote value add um, they they have the high quality th stuff and and they can they can expand the price. Yeah. So I, I think that that's a that's a good thing. I don't really see any other service that you would say you know what makes this service any different than any other service that's that's already in the U.S. You know yeah. we already have Spotify and Beats and the new YouTube service that's coming out and and you know every everybody and their brother has a service you know so so that's why I think it's getting it's getting a little bit crowded out there and and Title is perhaps one of the only unique ones. And we'll probably get to this later, but it seems like the niches that many of these companies are starting to look for are geographical. Yeah. You know, they're saying, oh, if I can become the India service, you know, then I'm going to have a leg up. Um, and, and that's where I see most of the expansion, with the exception of this, of this title niche. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the thing that, that people uh, tend to overlook, though, when they're talking about streaming services is they forget that Bandcamp is a streaming service, as right. well as a download store. You, can, you, know, you press play, you listen to the music, you like the music, you buy the music. And that, to me, that's, uh, that's just as interesting, if not more interesting, than a unique uh, point on, well, our streaming is higher quality. It's like you, you actually get to own this, uh, and you get to have a relationship with the artist. There's the subscribe to an artist. You know, all these things, they're doing some really kind of interesting stuff and innovative stuff in a space. But because they sell the music as downloads, people don't think of them as a streaming service. You get the app, you'll change, you know, you kind of change how you think about it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. That's right. And, you know, I, that, I was just thinking about the price point as well. You know, a company that goes for 50, 55, 60 million uh, is in the streaming space usually is either a company that is not doing so well and is selling, at, you know, a, a, 
uh, at a cut cut price or uh, it's a very new company this is a very strange situation of a company that is actually doing pretty well but it has remained small just because of the nature of how it was operating and so yeah it's, it's a completely unique case and it totally different from Spotify you know Spotify this week uh, uh, we can talk about the fact that they are apparently uh, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that they're raising uh, up to 15 mil 500 million dollars for their next round I can't even say it uh, uh, as and apparently hired Goldman Sachs uh, that in order to do it uh, and that would place the valuation of a company between seven and eight billion dollars so light years away from uh, the Aspiro uh, purchase price uh, uh, the fundraise would allow the company to lay its IP IPO until 2016 and that could make a big difference to the company given it's uh, the steep increase in subscribers reported over the last six months you know if they continue to grow at this pace then uh, they, that could be a significant difference in, in 12 to 18 months to, to the to the books of uh, Spotify and they started to be profitable in countries like the UK so uh, uh, we don't really know how if that can replicate in in, in other territories too, uh, so the you know Spotify's latest round was in 2013 and they raised a, a quarter of a billion, is uh, 250 million dollars, and uh, uh, to date the company has already raised uh, over half a billion dollars. So it, you know it's going to become a significant uh, uh, you know VC uh, backing here if they, if they do take this other half billion dollar round. And uh, let's remember that 15 percent of the uh, equity is held by the majors. So uh, Steve, for, uh, from your from your end, uh, how, how do you feel about this new round? Do you think that uh, it's wise for Spotify to wait uh, and uh, uh, you know wait on the IPO until it, it, it can sort of put a hold on it on its finances and really start uh, showing that it can be profitable in the long term? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm no financial advisor, but but it certainly seems like if you're if you're planning to raise five hundred million dollars, you know that that you think is pretty solid that's about to come in, and you have Goldman Sachs on your side, as opposed to you know some IPO, God knows what happens with that, what what all the investors will do. I, I think it seems like a solid decision, um, but again, you know, I, I still I'm I'm a little confused about Spotify's fundamentals. I mean, like you say, it's profitable perhaps in the in the UK. Um, but overall, the company, I mean, their, their last reports from what I've read, um, it's still kind of taking a loss. Right. And, and the whole model of sort of, you know, Andrew touched on this, but I'm, I'm a little unclear about how a standalone company like Spotify in the streaming space where they have to pay so many upfront costs to license music and so forth, it, it, you know, winds up being the, the main company in the streaming space. I mean, perhaps... Uh, a YouTube or a Beats Music that are owned by giant companies that have other ways of making money is it will be the future of this. But I don't know. I, I still feel like, you know, at least from my perspective here in the U.S., I still feel like streaming, while I do think it is the future of, of, of recorded music, I'm kind of confused about how much money's in it, and I feel like we're in a in a very speculative time. Yeah, and an and an interesting figure to throw out there as well is that Snap, which is the the French uh, uh, music trade body, has released some figures showing that uh, six euros uh, uh, twenty four out of every nine uh, ninety nine euro subscription, uh, whether it's a Spotify or Deezer, I think it's it's a combined figure, uh, uh, is uh, goes to music rights holders. So uh, at least we have some sort of hard hard numbers on France as to how much gets paid to right holders and and the rest is uh, uh, the platform's fee and uh, tax so interesting figures there uh, Andrew from your end uh, do you think that uh, it's becoming an, an insane amount of money or uh, you know uh, do you think it makes sense for Spotify to wait and see how, how the market develops over the next year I've got to be honest it's not a scale I operate at yeah. uh, so it's not really a number that I can I can't really even say you have a million dollars <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, that, that, uh, that French statistic is interesting because that 70% of all the money we receive goes out to rights holders this is the story that Spotify has been telling all along yeah. um, and the idea of you know well, well not enough money is going to rights holders not enough money is going to rights holders 70% of your uh, of your income going out is outcoming specifically to that one thing it's significant which makes you think that maybe the the amount of income is a problem as well as the amount that's going out to rights holders. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, there's the uh, how much of that money that's going to rights holders in inverted commas is going to artists. Yeah, apparently it's only 11. Yeah, apparently only 11% is going to artists as far as uh, this is coming from Music Business Worldwide. I think it was a it was a piece yeah. put up uh, just a couple of hours ago. It, it makes you wonder who actually these uh, the, the musicians who are angry at Spotify should actually be angry with. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, that's, <laughs> that's another story. I mean, that, but but those relationships have always worked like that. Yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of an interesting space. But in terms of you know, is is five hundred million there or six billion there? You know, 
I don't know. I mean, at this, at this point, it's all kind of imaginary numbers yeah, exactly, in my yeah. head, and, and it's not something I can kind of, I'm qualified to, to comment on. Yeah, but yeah. Um, it does seem like Spotify uh, um, are really keen to be the streaming service. Yeah. Um, and, and so if, I think tactically, this sort of thing is likely to be, uh, a, a, you know, shoring up position in terms of you know, dominance of the space. Yeah, and also really interesting this week to hear that Spotify has uh, uh, closed its Russian office uh, and uh, the, the office uh, that the uh, head of essentially of the Russian office was Alexander uh, Alexander uh, Kubanishvili. Uh, I'm sure I pronounced this wrong, uh, but he uh, will essentially leave on the 12th of February and the entire operation is winding down. Apparently Spotify has been in Russia for the past year and planned to launch in late 2014, but uh, uh, reviewed the current political and economic situation in the country as well as some of the uh, uh, laws around uh, the web that uh, are, you know, the regulations around the web that uh, are uh, making the whole ecosystem pretty feel pretty uncertain and they decided that it wasn't worth investing uh, their money in the country and they're pulling out. So this is is not so much about Spotify but it's kind of like a, it's a little bit worrying because it kind of shows that uh, companies like Spotify are pulling out and that means that Russia is becoming more isolated not just you know Russia in general but the people that are in Russia which is not not a great thing to see uh, I don't know if that's gonna replicate with other services but uh, uh, yeah I, I don't have much expertise on Russian streaming services uh, I know that we contact is very much used but if you guys don't have anything to add to this one I'll just move on <laughs> well, I was just going to say, it must be hard setting up any kind of multinational corporation within, a, within a, an ecosystem like that, um, because I know that, uh, that Russia is very keen on Russian businesses to, to be doing those sorts of things. So yeah. um, it, it's, it, it, it might just be as simple as being parochial, that, that it actually makes it hard for outsiders to come and set up when actually this is something that we've got the technology to do ourselves. Why, why aren't we doing it? Yeah. Um, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily look for anything more sinister than that other than, than this is you know uh, the kind of old school protectionism <laughs> absolutely I, I, the only thing i would add to that is just that just a broad comment about international streaming services particularly deezer although obviously spotify and, and others are doing the same it's just that each territory is so unique with it in terms of its musical tastes and you know you have to when you when you open a, a service like this in in some particular country you know you have to take you have to keep in mind sort of what the politics are, not only in the business, but, but in the culture, you know, yeah. and uh, in Brazil there, I was doing a story about this, it, you know, there's, there's certain people who like um, kind of biofunk type music, you know, and, uh, music from the favelas. And then there's certain people who sort of like, quote unquote, higher class music. And then, you know, some people are offended if they get too much of one kind displayed to them compared to the other. So it's very complex and interesting as these, these, you know, it, multinational uh, streaming corporations try to figure out how to expand and how they fight over territory. I think that'll be an interesting story in, in years to come as this business expands. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and one service that is actually uh, targeted, uh, uh, you know, the markets outside of the U.S. Uh, is uh, Guvera that also uh, has announced uh, reaching 2 million users uh, uh, in India in just, uh, uh, m just months after uh, launching in the country, uh, whilst the acquisition of Blinkbox, Blinkbox Music in the U.K. Uh, signals a forthcoming expansion into Europe. Europe at some point uh, soon uh, and that was from uh, the quality from Tesco obviously and uh, uh, so in November 2014 it expanded into Russia and Ukraine and now it's available in the Philippines Singapore Indonesia Malaysia Australia Hong Kong and Venezuela so uh, they want to be uh, in 20 new markets by June and up to 100 markets by the end of the year so a very bullish uh, expansion uh, uh, they must have raised some more money because the, the last round that I could uh, find information on was uh, f from 20 2010 and it was for 20 million dollars and I'm sure that's probably mostly burnt by now so they must have uh, managed to raise some new funding although that's not been uh, announced uh, as of yet uh, and uh, the, the Indian figures are interesting I mean we've seen uh, audio also make a play in India and, and launch uh, with uh, a bunch of local catalog uh, you know uh, as Steve was talking about you know international markets are difficult to navigate and uh, it's also difficult I guess for a single company to try and manage all of these different territories uh, effectively in terms of editorial and everything else you know we talked about that uh, when it came to Deezer for example that uh, some countries uh, uh, didn't have uh, uh, you know an editorial that was really uh, top notch because they just didn't have the resources to employ people in every single one of them it was 181 countries I think that they are in uh, so yeah uh, I mean uh, interesting around India uh, and any, any comments around India and what's going on there uh, in terms of the market? 
Well, if they're, if they're, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, if they're interested in really good editorial content, there's some really great people in India doing some fantastic stuff. Um, Only Much Louder is an uh, independent music, uh, I guess you'd call it a, a network, doing some really great stuff online. They're running festivals. They're doing all sorts of stuff. There's a great team of people there that can, can provide all sorts of content about local, particularly local, what they call independent music, we would call rock, pop, indie, you know. Um, but, uh, but in terms of um, setting up businesses in kind of international locations that list you gave was a list of countries with enormous populations and if you're setting up a, a, something that is based on pushing large amounts of data to lots and lots of people uh, you could have worse choices than India and Indonesia um, because there are just so many people you're streaming to and and with so many um, uh, smartphones in those marketplaces that it, it makes a, a you know a hell of a good call and then you start going into like um, if you're going to African countries as well the, the uptake on smartphones there is just I mean it, it dwarfs anything that's going on in uh, the US and UK um, so these kind of these these sort of established businesses who are going out to populations of a mere 60 million yeah. um, are, are sort of, they might be the biggest thing at the moment, but uh, it's not where I would look long term for uh, greatest number of users, greater, greatest amount of revenue or, or kind of company value. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Steve, uh, uh, any any interest in, in the market from, from where you stand? You know, have you, have you heard anything uh, your end? Not really. I mean, you know, like Andrew was saying, Two million, you know. That's, I'm sure that's sort of like a, a treasure or a prize for these services. And who can get to that number first? You know, will will have a leg up and or, or an advantage in their services. The whole streaming thing right now seems like a, I don't know if you guys have the game, the board game Risk, um, but <laughs> it, it just seems like that. It seems like we're just moving. The, you know, all these companies are moving these little pieces in, into various territories, um, and you know, and they're competing. They're trying to knock each other out, and it's a really very competitive, interesting world right now. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I always get stuck in Australasia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about Australia last week. Actually, it was an interesting, an interesting one because uh, their market keeps uh, keeps uh, uh, going down and down and down. And uh, Andrew, uh, let's talk, let's uh, take a break from talking about streaming and and uh, uh, hear a little bit about uh, the Music Bricks initiative that that you're involved in at the moment. Yeah, we've just launched it. It's a European project, uh, so funded by the European Commission. And what it does is it takes the uh, academic research that's coming out of the top universities who are developing like technologies for for music making specifically. Uh, these can be sort of physical objects or uh, APIs, graphical user interfaces, uh, tangible user interfaces, TUIs we call them, um, and putting them in the hands of uh, creative developers and artists and so on at music tech fest events and other events like that to get them to play with these technologies, kind of exclusive use of these new technologies coming out of the universities, play with them, and then we um, sort of essentially develop, using challenges, ideas for new types of commercial products or new types of performances, new research projects, those sorts of things. Uh, and then we kind of, using the, uh, the European Commission money, we sort of uh, support these to prototype stage so that they can actually sort of get on their feet and start and, and hopefully develop into something that can have a life outside of the Music Tech Fest. Yeah, and that's great. You know, I, I was really impressed when, I, when for example, the, to the Queen Mary open day of their of their you know, sort of digital of the music department, and there were so many ideas that were actually uh, actionably, you know, that were usable in a commercial setting. And so, and I think that's something that people don't, don't often associate with uh, universities that are doing projects of this kind. That actually, some of the tech that comes out of it can be productized. It was, it's amazing how much of the, the commercially available tech now actually comes out of research projects. So, uh, and it makes sense if you think about it. These are p smart people doing smart things. Um, something needs to happen as a result of that. And, and universities aren't always the best people to think of that. But if you put like creative people and technologists together in a room and you say, here is a thing that does something really interesting, what can you make from this? You'll get some fantastic ideas. Yeah, and it gives them a, an environment where they can actually uh, operate without having to, to create a profit right away, which is what happens in a, in a normal company. And so that, that makes sense you know the fact that they can come up with some some pretty exciting innovative stuff as well and uh, uh, on the other hand uh, for music text uh, uh, fest stuff for what, what's going on this year what, what are the key appointments that people should be looking out for well, Music Tech Fest Scandinavia is a big one. We've, we've done Music Tech Fest in London and Berlin, Paris, Wellington, Boston. We're, we're doing regions 
from from now on out because the, there are just so many pe- places that wanted a music tech fest. Yeah. So music tech fest Scandinavia is going to be happening here in Umeå, which is in the north of Sweden, land of the midnight sun. Uh, some really interesting stuff going on. Some fantastic, uh, some t- fantastic music. A lot of really great innovation here. But we're bringing all the Scandinavian community together um, in music tech. And as you know, there's a lot of Scandinavian music tech. We just talked about yeah. some, but also bringing people from across Europe and, and the US as well. Um, so that's 29th to 31st of May. Um, and uh, that's that's going to be probably the, the biggest thing we've done. Right. Um, and then we're doing Central Europe in September uh, in Ljubljana in Slovenia, which nice. is, uh, again, one of those things where it's a, it's a regional thing. We'll bring people together. But it's a, like I said, it's a festival of music ideas. Uh, it's going to have... Lots of people showcasing new technologies, uh, performing new types of uh, new types of music using new types of instruments, um, but also just sharing the ideas, making new things. We've got the twenty four hour hack camp. Um, we've got the uh, like I said, the music bricks thing, where we're going to be seeding new ideas, getting some exclusive tech into there from the uh, the universities, and uh, giving some creative challenges and, and having stuff come out of that. So September eighteenth to the twentieth in Ljubljana, but May twenty ninth to thirty first in Sweden is going to be our next big one, Music Tech for Scandinavia. Awesome, thanks for that. And uh, uh, Steve, I wanted to uh, just ask you quickly about uh, one of the pieces that you published uh, uh, this week, actually, around uh, uh, music industry and leaks. We haven't actually talked about the leaks that have happened recently much on the show, and we should have, really, uh, because there were pretty important stories, you know, Bjork's album leaking and uh, leading to her having to uh, uh, release it super early, and also Madonna's uh, leak. We talked about that a little bit more, actually, uh, around, uh, uh, you know, her her entire, a big part of her album leaking and her having to mix it uh, uh, in a hurriedly and, and releasing uh, 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 six or seven tracks, I think, uh, essentially an EP out of it early and then uh, as, a, as, a, as a token essentially towards the full album coming uh, later on. Uh, so uh, what was your take around leaks and how the industry is learning how to deal with them? I mean, I thought it was pretty impressive that both Madonna and Bjork were able to, you know, uh, deal with these leaks so quickly. You know, within 72 hours, both of them basically had full albums, or in Madonna's case, it was an EP, a six-song EP, up on iTunes for sale. You know, and they, they were completely cut, or so they said. I mean, Madonna compared the leak to, I think she said it was she was devastated, and I think she compared it to rape. Um, I may be yeah. remembering that incorrectly, but no, um, did, yeah. you know, so her, the, the type of language that she used suggested that this was not sort of, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really behind this. You know, th- this was, th- they, these people were kind of um, taken by complete surprise and were very upset by this. So I think it was pretty nimble for them to be able to do that. And I wouldn't have said that about artists or record labels or even management, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago. I, I had examples in my story of sort of, you know, when U2, which for some reason has been subject of leaks, major leaks for almost every album they put out in the digital age. Um, you know, in the past, they've sort of, oh, we have a leak. Let's take two weeks and we'll negotiate with VH1.com in order to get it on, you know, or let's let's have a radio station release some exclusive tracks 10 or 15 years ago. You know, that, that was the deal then. So things have changed and, and it probably could be even faster. And, and But I, I think that both of those artists, you know, made, as they say, made made lemonade out of lemons in that particular case. Yeah, yeah. And I'm super excited about Bjork's new things. And she's uh, apparently, there's an exhibition happening at MoMA in New York uh, later this year that I would love to go and see uh, about her essentially uh, career and what, what she's been doing. So that's, uh, that should be quite exciting. Andrew, uh, from your end, do, do you think that it's, you know, we've seen the end of leaks as far as, you know, being this, uh, you know, huge disruptor of releases or is this trying to continue? Uh, but artists are just better equipped to deal with it. I, I, well, I think whenever a leak happens, whether it's uh, engineered or uh, something that happens to people, the only thing that they think of is marketing opportunity. Yeah. You know, how do we use this? And I think that, that that doesn't kind of predict the end of anything or, or, or the future of anything. But um, what it does is it really shows you what the priorities are. So it's more important to capitalize on this marketing opportunity than it is to spend the next two weeks getting the record the way I really, really want it. Um, and I think that's a really interesting kind of um, uh, marker for, for an industry because that is the, that's the point of this exercise is it's a marketing exercise and a sales opportunity. And if a leak happens, regardless of why it happens, that is an occasion for marketing. It's nothing else. And, and so that is the level at which the response takes place. It's not, well, this wasn't ready and it's not, you know, the expression of my art that I want to share with the world. It's like, right, how do we use this? So I, I think that's kind of the, the telling thing about uh, about sort of particularly the, the major record industries. Yeah, and also like two different artists as well. 
you know, we're looking at Bjork, somebody who wouldn't uh, necessarily care or be particularly interested in, in being, you know, a number one album seller. And so perhaps the way that she dealt with the leak was different than Madonna's because Madonna would expect to get to the number one in the album charts. And perhaps the leak has disrupted that chance unless she, she manages to do that when the album comes out uh, uh, in, in a couple of months time, I believe. Uh, so yeah, uh, different approaches, also different types of artists and, and different aims uh, of what they want to do with their with their release. And uh, talking, you were talking about marketing, actually. There's an interesting story coming from a, a company called uh, Show.co, uh, who uh, used to be uh, uh, Sounddrop, uh, uh, so- Sounddrop, Sound- Songdrop, I, I, I was, Confuse it too. Anyway, uh, Show.co announced this week that it would allow it would allow users uh, of its marketing platform to gate a Spotify follow uh, in, in exchange for access to content. Essentially, uh, as, as you used to do with downloads and, and emails, you know, instead of giving up your email, you uh, 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 accept to follow the artist on Spotify, and then you get something in return. Uh, so this is an extension of, of course, uh, as uh, of the classic email sign up, uh, and uh, it's also a bit less intrusive, I guess. You know, in a sense. Uh, uh, I would imagine people would be more willing to to give give us a Spotify follow than to uh, give up their email address uh, and you know not knowing how many emails they're going to be subjected to over the, over the next few years essentially. Uh, at the same time, you know, not everybody has Spotify, so that's that's an issue. Uh, I, I don't know whether uh, you know you're going to lose some people in the process if you do that kind of gating. And also, the whole idea of gating is I'm not sure if it's still viable or how 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 you guys feel about that. Um, whole concept of giving something in exchange for something else uh, if there's no monetary transaction taking place. Uh, Steve? Yeah, I think it's fine. I mean, I think this is a, a tradition of, of something that the record industry has been doing in the digital age for, for years. You know, there, as you say, you'd have uh, downloads that unlock content. There used to be ways of unlocking content on CDs and DVDs. And yeah, I mean, I, I think it's good for fans. It's good for artists. I, I don't really have any pro- It seems, I mean, at this point, it seems to me to be a small thing um, you know, just some, just a little tiny value add thing that that um, artists and labels can kind of give to their fans, and um, so I think it's cool. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the effect of Spotify follows is also uh, uh, an interesting thing to look at. I, I, I mean, uh, Andrew, I don't know, are you a Spotify user or not? Have you? I am these days. Yeah, I, yeah. I wasn't for a long time. I had a real. Uh, I still have a problem with the lack of transparency and how. I, I don't have a problem with the amount of money being paid out, but the lack of transparency and how that happened. The fact that if I pay ten. Ten dollars a month, or whatever it is, uh, and I only listen to one artist that month. I know for a fact that it's not just that one artist who's getting all of that, that percentage of that money. And yeah. more to the point, that fifteen percent ownership by the, the major record labels, I would personally like to be able to listen to independent artists without giving money to the major record labels. I can't do that using Spotify. Oh, okay. So that, that's the, these problems. But however, like I say, I've, I've got quite good broadband here. And uh, to be able to just kind of listen to something I feel like listening to is a great thing. And this yeah. is actually one of the things that I think is, is the, the lesson that the, the record industry has never learned since we started in the, what we're calling the digital age, for the lack of a better term, is it doesn't help to say you can't listen to this unless you. Because there is so much stuff to listen to. We'll just we'll listen to something else. It's fine. Um, and so putting these roadblocks in front of people to say, look, you fill in this form and then we'll let you listen to this music. It's like, well, I'm going to go and listen to something else. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's not a problem for me. Um, so whether it's a follow on Spotify or an email address or whatever, um, it is preventing people from hearing music that they would grow to love, buy, have a relationship with the artist, go to concerts, buy merchandise, you know, all those sorts of things. It's like, just get out of the way. Are you crazy? This is, this is, this has been going on for 20 years now. You must have learned these lessons by now. Yeah. I was going to say, do, do you guys subscribe to any artists or any playlists? Because, I mean, that, that's a pretty powerful thing to uh, be able to get an email or, you know, a pop-up on your Spotify account on your phone that says, oh, there's a new track uh, by this artist or uh, yeah, a new track has been added to this playlist. So I guess, I guess there is value in having that relationship with fans, although it's not direct. Absolutely, but like I've done it voluntarily. I haven't been, been kind of um, blackmailed into it. I agree with your point, Andrew, about blackmail. Yeah, that makes sense. But I, I do think that, and, and I also agree with your point that there shouldn't be roadblocks for general customers and for music discovery. But I think that what this speaks to is a little bit of a different thing. This is sort of for hardcore fans of a certain artist who will follow them anywhere. Um, you know, I, if you're, if you have, it's it's sort of like the artist to fan thing. If you if you are, you're the kind of person who's going to follow around a band and see multiple concert tours of theirs, or you know, listen to all their rarities. You know, this kind of a thing is not that much of a roadblock. Like like, hey, I I really want to 
get the latest Bruce Springsteen song. So it's really easy for me to give up my Spotify follow or, or my click on an email link or whatever it is. Yeah, um, yeah but so you want I to click on that it because you want to click on it, not because you're not allowed to do something unless you do. No, no, I agree with you. I mean, the blackmail point of, of what you're saying it is it makes sense. I mean, I, I don't I, I think that's true. But on the other hand, I, I do think that there is a way that you can do this properly where it, it helps an artist to have a direct relationship with a fan um, to have more information about them, to be able to communicate with them better. In a perfect world, that type of relationship is, is something that this speaks to, and, and I think there are artists out there who are doing that more effectively. Not so much record labels necessarily, but artists and management generally do do this pretty okay. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be music as well. You know, uh, the, the gated thing could be even just like a rehearsal of, of a gig. So that could be the interesting part as well. You, you wouldn't have necessarily have to give away anything new, but if you were like, oh, if you want to see me rehearse for the gig in uh, New York, uh, then, you know, do a Spotify follow and then you can watch me uh, do it live or uh, anything like that. So th there are I guess different levels of what you can gate or what you can't gate. So, uh, and in that case, it will be the listener's choice really to to decide. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's certainly less offensive than the tweet for a track thing that was like you, you have to advertise yeah. this before you've even heard it. Yeah. Um, you know, recommend it to your friends, and then you're allowed to listen to it. That 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 kind of nonsense. I mean, this this at least is kind of uh, less you know uh, obnoxious than that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and talking about uh, you know services uh, uh, that are essentially uh, have been created to in order to promote artists uh, soundcloud is one of those uh, you know the the, the core principle of soundcloud was to essentially allow artists to collaborate and essentially and then it became a really important marketing tool because it was the, the one platform where uh, you know you could embed a track and you knew that people all over the world essentially could uh, stream it without any issues uh, they released a, a major revamp of its ipad app which brings it in line with the look and feel of the iphone update that was released in june 2014 uh, the app is is very snappy it's beautiful looking uh, but it does focus in entirely and exclusively on the uh, uh, listening experience and uh, you know Engadget had a headline saying SoundCloud says this app is good for listeners and bad for creators this is a, an argument that we've already had on the show uh, when the iPhone app came out uh, but this kind of feels like you know strengthening of that line and uh, and also a little bit puzzling on my end just because I, I don't find any social elements to that app which is strange considering that SoundCloud is all about community and, and there's no way of commenting on the tracks. You know, the timeline for them was a big thing. I guess, you know, trolling is, is a real problem on those on those uh, kind of comments. But, uh, you know, th there's a lot of things missing from it still. So I'm just hoping that it's sort of a, a skeleton of what's to come rather than the finished uh, uh, article. Uh, have you guys checked out the new app, either the iOS or the, uh, the iPad one? How, how do you feel about it? I haven't used it personally myself, but uh, sort of reading about uh, how it's structured and, and what it works, there's some really kind of interesting things in there. One of which is that you can't see a page with all of your own music on it, right. wh which has to come from the idea that music is only about promotion. It's only about sending it out. It's only about other people listening to music that I've chosen to listen to. And the, the professional tool that SoundCloud started out being, it seems like simply because they've, I mean, they've taken on an incredible amount of investment. They've, they've uh, expanded quite rapidly and they've, uh, they're working on a whole bunch of stuff. But it all seems very centered around moving music out to fans and to audiences and for promotion and for um, and for distribution, not necessarily for uh, as a professional back end tool for sharing tracks or collaborating on tracks or or just being able to go through your own music and being able to do stuff with that. So, um, yeah, it's it, it seems very much kind of a, a subscription playlist rather than a, uh, a, a music tool. Steve? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I mean, I don't use SoundCloud very much, frankly. I, if I come across a SoundCloud link of, a, of an artist that I'm interested in, I'll click on it and listen to it. That's the extent of my of my use. Um, but SoundCloud does strike me as as kind of the advantage that they have over other streaming businesses and streaming models is just that it's sort of like the post MySpace. It, it's a place where artists and fans can interact and they can exchange ideas and there's a social media aspect to it and this and that. These articles are suggesting that with the new apps, they're kind of trying to become more of a traditional streaming type service. Um, and I think, number one, you know, that suggests that maybe there's not that much money to be made in the old MySpace model, which we already knew. And, and number two, you know, they're, they're perhaps trying to become more of a generic streaming service. And that gets back to my point earlier of sort of how many more, you know, generic streaming services that don't have an extra thing like Titles High Fidelity or Deezer's ability to get into international markets. I mean, how many more services can we cram into this space, especially here in the U.S.? 
um, I think that's all being sorted out. I, I, I feel like this story, and I don't know much about SoundCloud, or and I haven't used it much, but this story suggests it's sort of trapped between its old model and thinking about its new model, and it's a little confused. Yeah, and, and but that's been the case for like a year or so. So that's that's why I think people are starting to to be a little bit more impatient now. They're, they're, they're thinking, well, what is going on here? You know, why uh, is there so much functionality missing? If if it is becoming a streaming service, and if it isn't, then what's happening to it? So yeah, I guess I guess there's, there's a lot of back and forth there, and hopefully we'll see a lot more functionality being added to the app uh, uh, soon, and and more social elements as well come into it because it, it, this this so well placed to, to to introduce some some sort of social element to the app that it's it's a shame that nothing uh, around that is is. Uh, is being done and uh, I wanted to uh, quickly chat about the Super Bowl yay uh, I, I, I know nothing about it in terms of sports uh, obviously uh, <laughs> I don't I don't follow uh, almost any sport I'm terrible uh, but uh, I uh, I was uh, intrigued by the halftime show I'm always intrigued by the halftime show so we usually uh, do a little bit of a section on it uh, after the Super Bowl on, on DMT but I think we've been doing it for the last three or four years uh, and so uh, this year uh, the uh, duties to perform at the halftime show uh, uh, were uh, 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 Katy Perry's uh, and she performed alongside Miss Elliot and Lenny Kravitz. The interesting thing is that uh, on the one side is that uh Missy Elliott uh, stole the show and uh, her sales apparently shot up a thousand percent uh, just in the one day because the, the, the week's sales ended on that on the day of the Super Bowl and just through that performance they shot up a thousand percent so that might actually carry on, on for the, for this week uh, too with lots of people thinking she was a new artist actually uh, remarkably because uh, she'd been out of the you know music uh, uh, or the front uh, forefront of the music industry for, for the past nine years since her last album release uh, and, and uh, so that was that was fun and, and on the other side, uh, we had a uh, Katy Perry that started that was selling merchandise uh, uh, in partnership with Universal and Pepsi directly on social media, and she was also using the Twitter buy button to in order in order to get people to buy this limited edition merchandise items uh, 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 as as a result of her performance at the Super Bowl. So uh, a couple of interesting commercial elements there. Uh, I don't know if uh, you guys want to pick up on one of them. I was I was quite impressed by the Missy Elliott one and the fact that people didn't know who she was. <laughs> Well, uh, yes. yeah, that, that's interesting, but the, the more interesting thing, thing for me is how statistics work. Um, and whenever you hear these stories and they've got numbers in them, you go, okay, how do numbers work? A thousand percent, it sounds like a big number. A thousand is a big number. Yeah. Um, but a hundred percent is the same amount again. Let's, let's not forget that. So a thousand percent is ten times that, right? So this is how numbers work. And the question is, that's a, 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 it's a, it's a ratio, right? So what was it before? Was yeah. she selling... 10 copies or a million a copies thousand, or five, you know. I think it was a thousand so, per each of the three hits that she played. And they shot up to 15 to 20,000 each, something like that. See, that's a number that makes sense. Yeah. But if you say a thousand percent, you, you're actually kind of saying, all you're saying is big number. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, the, 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 yeah, it's, it's a really, it's an interesting one. Um, but ac actually, you know, I think it's, it's great that she got in front of a really good audience because I think she's an incredible artist. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've thought that for a long time. But it also speaks to the demographic uh, that they're, they're pitching to. It's like this, this, I mean, Lenny Kravitz too. Lenny Kravitz has been around a while. Um, and this idea of, of putting kind of uh, established almost kind of legacy artists in that kind of slot says a lot about um, who they think their audience is and, you know, what the purpose of that is and what the marketing message of that is and, you know, what is the piece of communication that's going on? Yeah. Um, because actually they could have sold probably a lot more records um, by a completely different artist given a different demographic. So yeah. it's, it's a, yeah, it's those, that, it's a really complex uh, um uh, algorithm dynamic there yeah and, and it's yeah. funny I read people saying well, what is what is the guy from the Hunger Games doing on, on stage at the Super Bowl because <laughs> they didn't even realize that he was a musician they just thought he was an actor from the Hunger Games uh, so <laughs> That is uh, another one, a uh, funny one from for Lenny Kravitz. Uh, uh, Steve, from, from your end, how do you experience? Did you experience yeah, well, it? Do, 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 do you watch it? And uh, how do you feel to you as as a halftime performance compared to some of the others that have made uh, you know the headlines like Beyonce, for example? Yeah, as as the token American on this week's show, yeah. um, you know, I go Broncos. You know, I uh, um, I mean, number one, a, a few points. Number one. Um, I'm a huge Missy Elliott fan, so uh, I, I love her singles. I was dancing around the room, and my my 12 year old daughter, who uh, who's a Katy Perry fan, you know, was kind of looking at me funny. So I thought it was great. Um, you know, to to Andrew's point, um, I mean, it, I think the Billboard story said that she sold. You know, the thousand percent means she jumped to 
70,000 downloads sold. Yeah. You know, so she was on the Super Bowl and she only sold 70,000 downloads the, the week yeah. later. I mean, that strikes me as, yeah, a thousand percent seems like a big number and, and that's not a very big number. However, you know, the, the silver lining, I think, to that as far as Missy Elliott goes, and you could have perhaps said the same thing about, you know, the Red Hot Chili Peppers when they played last year during Bruno Mars's performance, which was kind of the same model, you know, a young headliner bringing back, as Andrew said, a, a legacy artist. I mean... In today's music business world, you don't really make that much money off recorded music. I mean, unless you're Taylor Swift or, or maybe Adele or the Frozen soundtrack. If you're Missy Elliott and, you, and you've got this big comeback and you're getting all the press, the question is, how do you take advantage of it now? How smart is she going to be? I mean, I don't know what she was doing over the last nine years. Probably we'll find she out. She's producing and songwriting. Apparently, she, she's done oh, okay. a lot. She's done a lot of stuff. It's just that nobody, okay, so nobody she's been knew doing she a lot behind the scenes. Yeah. I haven't. I'm sorry, I haven't followed followed but um you know at this point now she hasn't really had much of a much of a um a headlining persona as yeah. as a solo artist so you know now all of a sudden she has this opportunity to reintroduce herself could she start a tour could she sell something could she you know do some kind of marketing thing could she be on a commercial could she do stuff with brands i think that the lane is open to her right now and and the super bowl performance kind of single-handedly did that regardless of what the sales were so that i think that's that's very, very good for her. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so, kind of funny, so, like, you know, because you wonder, does she want to do a comeback? Because, you know, if you've been away for that, you know, such a long time and you've been happy producing and doing other stuff, was this a one off? That's, that's the other possibility, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, 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 be. I, the, mean, I don't think she said yet. The, the more interesting question for me would be how much did it cost her management to get her on there? Because <laughs> yes. I, I don't think that was a revenue making activity. I think that was an expense in the, in the budget. Could be. I mean, there was this, an article came out last summer, you make a good point, um, by the Wall Street Journal that said that before Katy Perry was announced, um, which, which suggested that the NFL was requiring Super Bowl headliners for the halftime show to pay to play, um, you know, and, and they, had, they had a bunch of artists who were considering it. Coldplay was one of them. Katy Perry was another. And then Katy Perry came out, you know, a few weeks ago before the Super Bowl and said, I'm not the kind of girl who would pay to play. So, you know, the whole thing's very mysterious. We haven't gotten it confirmed one way or the other. But I agree with Andrew. I'm sure that there was money exchanged hands to, to get on this and Lenny Kravitz too, probably. Yeah, somewhere, somewhere somehow, some money changed hands. Yeah. <laughs> it was probably worth it, in Missy's case, certainly. <laughs> Great. And, uh, well, I think uh, we've uh, come to the end of the show. It was fun talking about the Super Bowl. And also Madonna announced her performance at the uh, Brits. So that's always interesting. Uh, we're going to see how that pans out. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that's not, not much else left to talk about. But, uh, Andrew, anything else that you wanted to point us to? Uh, otherwise, just the Music Tech Fest website, if you want. MusicTechFest.org. Perfect. And thank you so much for your time today. You're very welcome. And Steve, uh, from your end, uh, anything you wanna you wanna talk about, and also like uh, you know, t tell us more about uh, about the book. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I finished it. I sent my man. It's a it's a biography of Michael Jackson. Um, it focuses on music and dance and performance. Although there may be a line or two about nose jobs and child molestation trials. It can be helped. Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, but you know, it's it's really I, I really get into the depths of sort of how he came up with the moonwalk and how he put all the albums together and the tours together and a lot of Motown stuff and and that kind of stuff was a lot of fun. I I wound up interviewing something like four hundred and forty people, um, and and so uh, it was it was pretty intense, and I'm glad it's over. And they're saying it'll come out this this coming October. Very exciting, and we'll keep you, we'll keep our listeners updated on that as well. Uh, thanks so yeah. much for your time, and thank you so much for listening to Digital Music Trends. You can find everything on digitalmusictrends.com or follow us on at Digi Music Trends. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week, and uh, till next time. 